In the next couple of videos, we're going to step back from the trees and try to figure out why are we using these fairly complex X-bar structures. The short answer is that they allow us to explain some very interesting phenomena in human syntax. Here we'll take a look at two of them. We'll look at grammaticality and constituents. And grammaticality, by the way, is the property that allows us to say sentences like colorless green ideas sleep furiously. So we've been drawing trees, lots of trees. But one way to look at trees is to imagine them as a series of rules. Here, for example, we have a noun phrase. And we can imagine that the noun phrase is projecting a noun bar. And that the noun bar is projecting a noun. So this structure here for the noun phrase for coffee could be explained using these rules. Likewise, the structure the cat could be redrawn like a series of rules. A determiner phrase projects a determiner bar. A determiner bar projects a determiner followed by a noun phrase. And then the noun phrase projects the same n bar and the n bar projects the same noun as in the previous case. By the way, this triangle here means that we are um, not writing the whole structure. This is an abbreviation, but that we know that inside of the NP there should be an n bar and an n which is kept. So every rule could be, every tree, I'm sorry, could be rewritten as a series of rules. And the collection of these rules, the totality of the rules that can generate trees in English would be called the grammar of English, because this is what lets you generate new sentences of English. So somewhere in your brain as a speaker of English, you must have a rule that looks something like this, that tells you that a determiner phrase can eventually project a determiner and a noun phrase, as in the cat. Somewhere you must have some kind of rule like this, and your brain must not have a rule that uh, can construct a phrase like cat the, where you have the noun phrase first and then the determiner. If your brain does not have a rule that can project this structure, it means that this is not a sentence that you could generate using English rules. We're going to call such sentences ungrammatical sentences. It means that the grammar of the language, so the collection of all of the rules that you can use to generate trees, does not contain a rule that could generate the sequence cat the, that has the sequence noun phrase the term. We're going to call this an ungrammatical sequence of English. And we're going to denote ungrammaticality by an, with an asterisk. So if we have an asterisk before a sentence, it means that it's ungrammatical, that it's not part of the syntax rules of English. This leads to some very interesting results. If the grammar is a collection of syntactic rules, it must mean that any uh, sentence that you could generate with these rules is it can be explained with the grammar of English. So it means that grammaticality, the property of being an English a sentence of English, is independent from meaning. And indeed, we have many sentences in English that are meaningless, but that conform to the grammatical rules of English. For example, colorless green ideas sleep furiously. In this sentence, we have an inflected phrase, because this is in the present tense. It has the subject, noun phrase, colorless green ideas. And all the adjectives are adjuncts to the noun head, ideas. We have a verb phrase with the head sleep, because this is the main verb of the sentence. And it is described by an adjunct, which is an adverb, furiously. So this sequence of words is correctly, it's a correct way to format words in English, and it is grammatical. But it is meaningless. It, has, it makes no sense. So grammaticality is, so having a meaning 
It's not a necessary condition for a sentence to be uh, grammatical, to be a part of the English language. Because if you think about it, it's kind of strange. We can use grammaticality to do research in syntax, to try to figure out why some languages are different from others. For example, um, here we have sentences in English like, I eat apples often, and I often eat apples. In the first sentence, we have the verb eat, and then the direct object apples, and then the adverb often. In the second sentence, we have the adverb often, and then the verb eat, and then the direct object apples. So somewhere in your brain as an English speaker, there must be a sequence of rules that can generate this order in a sentence. But take a look at the third one. I eat often apples. This sentence is not a sentence of English, meaning that, in, that your brain does not contain a sequence of rules that could generate verb, adverb, direct object. So these sequences exist in your grammar of English and this sequence does not. Interestingly, this must be part of the difference between one language and another. Let's compare these with the French equivalents. This one is, je mange des pommes souvent. I eat the apples frequently, often. So mange is a verb, the pomme is a direct object, and souvent is an adverb. So these two are exactly the same sentence, and both of them are grammatical sentences of English and French. But here's where the similarities stop. In English, you can say adverb, verb, direct object, but in French, you cannot. You cannot say, j'ai souvent mange des pommes, with the adverb souvent, the verb mange, and the direct object des pommes. On the other hand, the order that was illegal in English is good in French. Je mange souvent des pommes. You have the verb mange, the adverb souvent, and the direct object des pommes. So it means that in your brain as an English speaker, the first and second rules exist, and the third one does not. And in the brain of a French uh, speaker, the first and the third rules exist, but the second one does not. So this is what makes the differences between languages, the collection of syntactic rules that you have. Um, one quick extra thing. Phrases are made up of constituents. These are phrases that could stand on their own. For example, the phrase, the cat, has two constituents. Cat, the cat. Because you can say both of these and they make sense. In the phrase, the big amazing salad, this phrase has four constituents. Salad, amazing salad, big amazing salad, and the big amazing salad. So constituents, again, are uh, parts of the phrase that could be like their own mini phrase. The X bar levels are there to mark the edges of constituents. If you take a look at every X bar we've done this week, you'll notice that you could say everything below the X bar and it would be a phrase, a phrase that could stand on its own, like cat, the cat. In this one, in colorless green ideas, you can have ideas, color, uh, I'm sorry, ideas, green ideas, colorless green ideas. So constituents are parts of the phrase that could stand on their own and still make sense and they are delimited by the bar levels. In summary, grammaticality is a property of phrases and sentences. So if a sentence is grammatical, there are a series of rules of syntax in your brain that can be used to generate that sentence or to parse it to understand it if you receive it. A sentence is ungrammatical if the sentence does not have a series of syntax rules that can generate that sentence. Notice that how different this is from the prescriptive concept of grammaticality, where something is ungrammatical because it's ugly or because it's aesthetically unappealing, like ending a sentence with a preposition or double negatives, for example. Um, someone can say that they don't like them, but these sentences make sense. Whereas in syntax, something is ungrammatical if it actually does not make sense, like katta, because there's not a rule that could generate that. So this is when we will understand linguistics as ungrammatical, a sentence that could not be generated by the grammar of the language. Phrases are made up of constituents, which are phrases that could stand on their own. 
the next video we'll look at more properties of x-bar trees.